Hi folks, and welcome to this video building out a GitOps pipeline using Flux CD. My name is Sid, also known as DevOps Directive here on YouTube, and I'm a developer advocate working with Akamai to bring you this tutorial. First, let's talk about GitOps and the problems that it's trying to solve. When first getting started with Kubernetes, you probably deployed your resources in one of two ways. Either you ran kube control apply from your computer, or you ran it within a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline with each code change. There's a couple of issues. First is that it happens only once and over time, people may make changes to those resources, so you're not sure what the actual state of things are in the cluster. This leads to the second point that there's no easy way to know what's deployed in the cluster without inspecting it, the cluster itself. GitOps attempts to solve these by first storing all resources within a Git repository. This provides a full history with easy access to look at what's deployed. And second, resources are continuously synced into the cluster so that if there is any configuration drift, it will be remediated. There are two main tools people think about when it comes to GitOps, Argo CD and Flux CD. Both are graduated CNCF projects and used widely by many companies. Today, I'm gonna to be building out a pipeline using Flux. The same type of thing could be built with Argo CD, but I'm personally more familiar with Flux, so that's what I'll be using. There's a link in the description to provide $100 credit to new Akamai customers for you to follow along with today's tutorial. Without further ado, let's get started. Before we dive in and start implementing code and configurations, let's talk a bit more about what GitOps is and some of the core principles behind it. Weaveworks is a company that was a pioneer in developing GitOps methodologies and is the creator of Flux. They have this great webpage in which they talk about the four core principles of GitOps. The first of which is that your system must be declarative. The declarative nature of Kubernetes makes it a great fit for GitOps, but other systems can use GitOps approaches too. The second core principle is that your system must be versioned and immutable. This is why Git plays such a key role here. With each new commit to the repository, you get a new state, which has a new version, and that state cannot be changed. Only by adding a new version with a new commit can we adapt our system over time. This provides a single source of truth for your system and a clear history of all the changes that have been made to it. Now, the third core principle is that it must be pulled automatically. This is to remove human bottlenecks in the process and ensure your system stays up to date over time. The final core principle is that your system must be continuously reconciled. This is what things like Argo CD and Flux do. They provide software agents, which you install into your cluster, which continuously compare the desired state from Git with the actual state of the cluster and work to reconcile the two and make sure that they are the same. Now, as we build out this pipeline today, the sample application that I'll be using is an application called Pod Info. It's a simple application, but it will allow us to showcase all the different key aspects of GitOps, including deploying from the state of our Git repository, automatically reconciling that state, and performing automated upgrades when new container images become available. At this point, I'll jump over to the Akamai Cloud Manager and provision a Kubernetes cluster that we'll use for the rest of the tutorial. I'll just click Create Cluster, call it GitOps Demo, select a region, a Kubernetes version. Since this is just a tutorial, I don't need the highly available control plane. And I'll provision a few shared CPU nodes to the cluster. While Akamai is off provisioning that cluster, we can go ahead and prepare our local environment. The first thing I'm gonna do is install the Flux command line tool. You can find the documentation for doing so at fluxcd.io slash flux slash installation. In my case, I'm on a Mac, so I can use Homebrew with the brew install flux cd tap flux command. As you can see, I already had the latest version up to date, and now I can use the flux command line. Awesome. Let me download my admin cube config from the Akamai interface and move that into my working directory. I'll now set my cube config environment variable to my present working directory and that file. And so now if I do a kubectl get nodes, we can see the three nodes I provisioned in my cluster. The next step is going to be installing Flux into the cluster. Luckily, the flux command line has a bootstrap command that's gonna make that very easy to do. We're gonna install a few different components, the key ones being the source controller. That's gonna be what talks to GitHub, pulls in the state of our repository, customize controller. That's gonna use a tool called customize to look at our resources and stitch them into the proper configuration that we can apply to the cluster. The helm controller, 
which is similar to the customized controller, but instead of working on raw YAML, it works on Helm charts and Helm repositories. We will not be looking at the notification controller, but what that does is allow us to very easily send notifications to places like Slack if there are information or er warnings or errors coming out of the Flux system components. And then we will be installing the image automation controllers, both the image reflector controller, which is going to look at a container image repository and find the available tags, as well as the image automation controller, which is going to, based on those available tags, update the state of our Git repository automatically. Now, before we can run the bootstrap command, we're gonna to need to generate a personal access token on GitHub. Uh, that's what's gonna be used to authenticate Flux to the repository and make all the changes that are necessary. If you go up to the top right-hand corner under your profile and then choose settings, all the way at the bottom, you can see developer settings. Then we're gonna generate a personal access token. I'm just gonna use a, a classic one for now. You'll click generate new token classic. We'll add a note so we remember what this is for. This is for Akamai GitOps. You can set it to expire whenever you want. This is gonna only be used temporarily because we're gonna add a deploy key to the repo that's gonna be used long-term. So I'll actually set it to seven days. And then we'll set the scope for the personal access token. In this case, we need to be able to read and write from the repo because we're gonna, Flux is going to make commits to the repo. And I think that should be sufficient. Now, if we click generate token, it provides us the token here at the top and I'll click copy. And then we'll export that as GitHub underscore token. Great. As you can see here above, I've written out the bootstrap command that we're gonna to need to run in order to install Flux into our cluster, commit those changes back to that same repo and add a deploy key. Now looking at each line here, this is telling it which repo and which owner. So I'm the owner of this repository. The repository is named Akamai GitOps Demo. We're gonna use the main branch. The path within the repo where I want it to store these YAML files is clusters slash GitOps Demo. You could have multiple clusters managed by the same repository. And so that's how we set this up. The default would be to have a read only deploy key. But in this case, I want it to have read write access because I'm gonna automatically update image tags from the cluster itself. And then we're adding the two additional components that are not available in the default install associated with that image automation. So the image reflector controller that I described and the image automation controller. Token auth just says, rather than store my personal access token as a secret in the cluster, I want you to generate a an SSH key pair, the public key of which will go into the repo as a deploy key, and the private key will be stored as a Kubernetes secret in my cluster. With this, I should be able to copy this command, make sure that my cube control is pointing to the right cluster. Great. And then let's run it. As we can see, a whole lot of stuff is happening here. First, it's using that personal access token to connect to github.com for the repository I specified. It clones the repository and switches to the main branch, which is the one I wanted. It then generates the YAML for all of the Flux components, commits those back to the main branch, pushes them, then installs Flux into the cluster. Here it's output the public key that it's gonna use as a deploy key on the cluster. And if we go back to the repo under settings, and deploy keys, we see that we just added a new key here a couple of seconds ago. This is how Flux continuously accesses the, the repository and pulls the state in. It looks like all components are healthy. Let's double check that by looking at all the pods in the Flux system namespace. We can see the Helm controller, the customized controller, the two image automation controllers, the notification controller and the source controller. Those are all the components we care about. It looks like they've all been running for a minute now. So now we can start using them to automate our cluster. The other thing that I'll do is do a git pull, and this is gonna pull in all the changes that Flux added to my git repository. So if I navigate to the proper directory, do git pull. First, right now, all we have is a make file, a readme and a to-do. Once I do git pull, it adds this cluster subdirectory, just like I told it to, cluster slash GitOps demo. And within there, we can see there's a Flux system subdirectory with GOTK, that stands for GitOps Toolkit Components and GitOps Toolkit Sync, as well as a customization file. This customization file just references the other two. The GitOps Toolkit Sync file references our Git repository. So Flux has a custom resource in Kubernetes 
called a Git repository. And that's how we reference Git repositories as external sources. It also has a concept called customizations, and this tells Flux where within that Git repository it should look and keep things in sync. In this case, the path is specified as clusters GitOps demo, so everything within this directory will get synced via this customization. Now that Flux is installed in our cluster, we can start to think about how we want to structure our repository and all of the resources within it. There's a few different guides here on the Flux documentation, uh, the first of which is the one that we're going to follow. It's called monorepo. And so this is the approach you would use if you want all of your Kubernetes manifest in a single Git repository. We're going to have a few different sort of teams, and those teams are going to have different environments within our cluster. You could have those separated at the cluster level. We're going to keep them separated at the namespace level to keep things simple. In this case, the repository structure is going to have a cluster subdirectory. We just saw that. It was created by the bootstrap process. That's where we store all of the Flux system components. Then we're going to have an apps subdirectory. That's going to be where we put that pod info app. And then we're going to have a base directory as well as different environment full directories within that. And then if there were any sort of baseline infrastructure tooling that we would want installed in our clusters, this might be things like log aggregation or metrics collection. Those would go in the infrastructure subdirectory. A couple other potential options that you could follow if you didn't want to have a monorepo for these re resources is that you could have a separate repository for each environment. So one for staging, one for production. You could have a separate repository for each team. That way you can kind of have isolation at the team level or you could have a separate repository per application. If you're going through and setting up Flux for your team, it'd be useful to read through this and understand the different trade-offs. I think for the purposes of demonstration, the monorepo provides a great option, and I've used it before with systems of, of many applications. Let's go ahead and set up that structure within our repo. So I can do make dir apps, and we'll navigate into apps. Within apps, we're gonna have four directories, uh, the first of which is gonna be called base, the second of which is going to be called team base, third of which is called team overlay, and the fourth is team helm. And so within that base directory, we're going to put all of the base YAML files. So these are kind of the starting point for our uh, deployment. Team base is effectively going to be using those configurations within the base directory with no changes. Team overlay is let's say another team or a different environment, and they're gonna use a customized overlay to change some values within the base files. And then Team Helm is gonna take a different approach altogether, and they're going to use a Helm chart to install pod info. Now I'm gonna keep the application quite simple so that we can focus on what the GitOps components are doing. Uh, and so I'm gonna create a deployment that's gonna reference that pod info application, uh, and we're gonna use that to deploy that into the cluster. That's gonna be within the base directory to start. We're going to keep this about as simple as we can. It's of type deployment. Uh, it is going to be named pod info. We're going to use a selector to tell the deployment which pods it should be controlling. That label then gets applied within the template. And we specify the one container within our pod, which is going to use a publicly available container image, GitHub container registry slash Stefan Prodan, who's the author of this application, pod info, and then a version 5.0.0. We're also going to specify the port so that we know which port to port forward when we access the application. Now, in addition to the deployment.yaml, I'm going to add a customization.yaml. And this is what tells Flux how to assemble all of the different individual YAML files and apply them to the cluster. In this case, it's just going to be a few lines. We're telling Kubernetes that it is a customization, uh, and then we're referencing that deployment.yaml file. I can now use the tool customize to see what resources that this would actually render. In a normal case, you would have multiple resources here. We have just a single resource, that deployment.yaml, but we can do k customize and then a period. And it's going to use customize to assemble all of the YAML files referenced by that customization. In this case, like I said, it's just the deployment. OK, so there's our base, and that's what we're going to use to construct our different environments. The first environment is going to be our team base. So I'll navigate to that subdirectory. Within team base, uh, I'm going to create a namespace because we're going to isolate these things by namespaces. To define a namespace, we just give it a, we say it's API version one, namespace, and then give it a name. That should be sufficient. 
And now because we're using that mono repo approach, there could be multiple applications referenced within this app subdirectory. So I'm going to create a distinct directory for this particular application, pod info. And then within this pod info directory, I'm going to create a customization.yaml that references my base customization. And so very similar to before, except now I'm specifying that this should live in the team based namespace. Uh, and we have a relative path from my current file to that base customization directory. Once again, I can use the kubectl customize command to see what resources this is going to render in the end. As you can see, it pulled in the deployment from the base configuration, even though no deployment.yaml is defined within my team base subdirectory. At this point, I should be able to commit this back to the Git repo and see it appear in the cluster. Just to confirm, if I do kubectl get namespaces, currently there's no team base, there's no team overlay, etc. Um, so I'm going to commit this to the repo, and then about a minute later, when Flux reconciles, it will pull that in and deploy these resources. If I look at my git log, I can see that the lightest commit to main is the one I just made, eb99. I can see that it lists in the flux system namespace, the main branch on that same commit. This means that it's pulled in that latest commit and let's check how it's doing. If you'll notice, no new namespace is created, and that's because I haven't told Flux where to look for this application. In that case, I need to add a new, custom, a new Flux customization to my cluster subdirectory to tell it about my apps customization. In order to do that, I'm going to create a file called appsteambase.yaml, And this is going to be a Flux customization, which is a specific type set up by Flux. It tells it where to look for its different applications. Uh, in this case, we're setting up syncing for that team-based subdirectory. So this is going to allow us to provision our base configuration. Uh, it references the Git repository source. So this was set up during the bootstrap process. and tells it to run once every minute. So that's how often it's going to try to sync this customization. The prune, set, the prune true setting says that if we delete something from the Git repo, we want Flux to delete that from the cluster. So that's a true GitOps model where the state of the cluster should represent the state of the repo. And this lives in the clusters GitOps demo subdirectory. Uh, and it's going to get pulled in because as part of the bootstrap process, we set up a Flux customization that's monitoring that subdirectory. I'll go ahead and commit this. Now we could wait the whole minute, or we can do flux reconcile sources, get flux system. Now let's check on the different customizations, flux get customizations. And we see not only do we have the flux system customization, this was set up during the bootstrap, we also have this new apps team base customization. Hopefully that's pulled in our new namespace and our new deployment. Looks like we have a new team-based namespace. And a new pod info deployment within that team-based namespace. Just to check on that application, we can do a kubectl port forward uh, in the team-based namespace. The name of the pod is pod info 5cdb. Uh, and we're going to use port 9098 to 9098. If I now access localhost 9898, zoom in a little bit, you can see we have the default base configuration for pod info. It's got this nice blue background, and that's going to be the thing that we change from each of these environments is the background color. It also tells us which version it's running, 5.0.0. Great. At this point, we've seen how to create a base configuration and deploy that. Let's now add an overlay, which will use that customized controller to inject a different color as an environment variable within my deployment. And we'll see that deployed into the cluster into a new namespace. The process is going to look pretty similar to before. So I've navigated to that team overlay subdirectory. And the first thing that I'm going to do is create a namespace. I'll copy the namespace from the base directory. Uh, but instead of team base, this is going to be team overlay. Great. We'll also want a pod info subdirectory representing this application. 
So again, I'll paste that in. We are going to reference the base, but in addition to that, we're going to need to create an overlay file. And so that's going to be a deployment.yaml. And within this deployment.yaml, everything from the base is going to get pulled in automatically, but we're going to add in one new field. And we only need to specify the new fields or the fields that we're changing because this is customized is going to take this and merge it with our original base configuration. We reference the name pod info and the type deployment. And then at the specific path that it's needed, we specify the pod info UI color as this 007300. And now how do we align this with the other configuration? We need to add a little bit to our customization file called patches. Within patches, we need to provide it a path to the file that we're going to use as the patch. In this case, it's in the same directory, so we just say deployment.yaml. We also want to update the namespace reference here so that we deploy into our new isolated namespace. At this point, let's use the kubectl customize command to see what's going to come out. We get our new namespace updated. Everything else should look the same as the base, except for this section. We're adding this environment variable section where we're specifying a new UI color. Awesome. Now the final piece is again, we have to tell Flux about this uh, different team. And so in this case, it's a different namespace. Uh, it's a different team. We're going to add a new Flux customization to our cluster subdirectory. We go back here. It's going to look pretty much the same as team base. We're going to change the name here and here. And otherwise, that should be good. So let's go ahead and commit all this back to the repo. Now we'll check in our cluster. We see the new team overlay namespace came online. And we see our new pod up and running. Again, let's port forward to it and see if that UI color indeed changed. The command will be similar to before, but we need the overlay namespace. We need the new pod name. If we refresh, we see the background has changed from that nice blue to this nice green. We also can see the pod name, which is updated to be the one that we just deployed. And as I mentioned before, while we are deploying into separate namespaces within the cluster, now oftentimes these would be separated at the cluster level. Those clusters might not even be in the same region. Uh, I'm just keeping it within a single cluster and isolating my namespace for simplicity. If we did want to add another cluster, we would do the bootstrap process again, and we would get another cluster with a different name. So our cluster name is GitOps Demo. Maybe it would be GitOps Demo Prod uh, or GitOps Demo Staging. And we would have another subdirector here managing that secondary cluster. So now we've, we've deployed a base configuration. We've deployed a, a slight change via a customized overlay. Now I want to show you how to use Helm to deploy with Flux. We're going to navigate to the Team Helm subdirectory. Again, we need a namespace definition. So we add our namespace definition there at the top. And it's at the top rather than in one of the application subdirectories uh, because it is shared across any applications that we're deploying for this team within this namespace. Uh, we'll create our pod info subdirectory for this particular application. And while in the overlay configuration, we reference that base configuration. Here, we're kind of starting from scratch, and we're going to create a, a new source. So rather than the source being a Git repository, the source is going to be a Helm repository. Uh, and then instead of a deployment, we're going to use a Helm release as the mechanism for actually deploying this. Thing. That Helm release behind the scenes will create a deployment for us. So as I mentioned, we need a Helm repository. Again, this Helm repository is a Flux-specific custom resource, and it allows us to point to a Helm repository and pull that in as another source that we can use to deploy with. Uh, in this case, we're giving it a name. We're putting it in the namespace along with the application itself. Now, this could live in the team namespace, or it could live in the Flux system namespace. Either of those are fine options. Here, I'm choosing to put it in the team namespace. 
We're telling it how often it should check that repository for new updates, so every 10 minutes. And then we're providing uh, a URL where it can find it on the internet. So that repository by itself isn't going to do anything. It's just going to tell us what is available in terms of Helm charts. That's where we create a Helm release object. This Helm release object references the Helm repository that we just created. Uh, it tells us which chart within that repository, because a Helm repository can have multiple Helm charts. Uh, it, we can specify a release name. In this case, I'm calling it pod info. And if you're familiar with Helm at all, normally you would have a values.yaml file that allows us to customize different things about how it's going to be used. In this case, we can inline those values right within this Helm release file. So we've got a values key. And then in here, this would be normally in your values.yaml, but here we're pulling it into this um, Helm release file. Uh, and just like with the team overlay, we're going to set a new different color via this value uh, of 4F00A3. And so that will be the new background color for the home deployed copy of pod info. And so those are the two main pieces of deploying with Helm. Now we kind of need to do that same wiring up uh, like we did before. We're going to need to create a customization.yaml. And in here, we're going to reference the two resources that we just created. Uh, we're going to put this within our uh, team Helm. And then again, we need to create that flux customization up here in the cluster subdirectory in the GitOps demo cluster. And tell flux to look in that team Helm subdirectory. So we're going to update this to Helm, update this to Helm. And with that, we should be able to commit this. Now, if I do flux get customizations, we can see the new Helm customization online. If I do flux get Helm releases, and the default when you use the Flux CLI is going to be to look in the Flux system namespace. So here I'm passing it the dash A to look in all namespaces. And we can see we have our Helm release. Uh, it successfully pulled in the chart from that public repo and deployed revision 6.5.4. Awesome. Once again, let's port forward and make sure that we got the updated UI color. And in the Helm chart, it's a deep purple. So we had the blue default, then we went to green, then we went to purple, just showing you how we can use these different tools and different components within the Flux ecosystem to make tweaks to our environments. Because ideally, with a GitOps approach, you're going to have multiple separate environments that you're defining all via this Git repository. At this point, we've seen how to get the resources from our Git repository or from a Helm repository and deploy those and sync those within our cluster using Flux. The next piece of the puzzle is sort of how do we automatically detect when there's a new version available and update the state of our Git repo accordingly? And so that's where the image automation, image update automation controllers come in. Uh, and we're going to configure those now. We installed them during the bootstrapping process, but now we have to tell Flux where to look for those new image tags and what to do with them when it finds it. Now, as always, we're going to manage these resources with Flux as well. I'm going to create a new top level directory that's going to contain all these things, because these are a little bit different than the apps themselves. These are more akin to the infrastructure components that we saw before. So I'll call this infrastructure. Within infrastructure, I'll create a new file called image repository. Like the Helm repository, this tells Flux where to look for the source that we're going to use. In this case, it's a container image repository. It's the GitHub container registry, uh, the author of this application who publishes these images, uh, and the name of the image itself. So this will have Flux go off and every minute check that repository and see if there's any new image tags available. Now, the next piece of the image automation is what's called an image policy. So once we have that set of tags from the repo, we need to decide what tag we want to use. And so the way that we specify that is what's called an image policy. The important things here are that we reference our image repository that we just created. So we're, we're referencing that pod info image repository. And then we specify the policy itself. In this case, we're saying, we want to use semantic versioning. So that, that means the first digit is major changes. The second digit is minor changes. So uh, new features, but not breaking changes. And then the third uh, digit is patches. So bug fixes, that type of thing. The range gives us a filter. So we can say 
anything greater than 5.0, which is our current version, we're going to accept. And so this policy is going to look at all of the tags provided by that image repository and return the highest tag that meets our range. Um, so if there is a new version available, which I happen to know there is, it's going to look at this and say, OK, let me just provide the highest semantically version tag from that repo. However, what do we then do with that information that we know that there is a new version available and we know which one we want to use? That's where the final piece of the puzzle comes in, and that's the image update automation. And the in image update automation is a little more complex than the first two. There's a little more that we need to specify, but it is how we tell Flux what we want to do with an image when it detects a new version. Um, effectively, we want to have Flux make a commit back to the repository and automatically change that state so that then Flux can pull the new state and update the image within the cluster. So it's kind of this closed loop system where we push a new image to our repository, Flux detects that, updates our git state, then detects that, pulls that new git state in, and updates our image within the cluster. The key things here are that we're going to use the main branch because that's the one we're working on. Uh, we're specifying who the user that's making those automatic uh, commits is going to be. In this case, it's Flux CD bot. Uh, we can provide it a message template, so what commit message it should use so that we have something nice to see uh, when we go back and look through the Git history. Uh, in this case, we could push directly to main, and that would get updated automatically. I'm going to push to a separate branch so that we can go see that, uh, see that change in a pull request and then merge that in. And so that's two two different approaches. You can have it commit directly to main and everything's fully automated. Um, if you are still sort of developing your system and, and gaining trust with it, you might want to push to a separate branch and just make sure everything's behaving as expected before you push directly to main. And then finally, this uh, update strategy tells us how Flux is going to find the proper images to update within the code repo. So it needs to search through our entire repo and find the associated lines that need to be updated with the new tag. Uh, and the setter strategy is how we're going to do this. The root path here just says that we want to look across the entire repo uh, and try to find the appropriate images. Now, the way that it actually finds those images is through a special comment tag that we add to our YAML files. And so we're going to go find that image tag within our app subdirectory in the base uh, configuration in our deployment. And so we need to annotate this specific line with this comment. And this tells Flux, hey, this is the line that you need to update with the new tag. So we're referencing our image policy name. We're telling it which namespace that image policy lives in and the name of the image policy. And so with this, everywhere in the code base that this specific annotation exists, it will replace this string with the updated tag string that it finds. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is once again, we need to tell Flux about the new infrastructure subdirectory. This is going to look just like our other Flux customizations. Uh, we're providing it a name, and we're telling it where within the repo to find the corresponding YAML files. That should be good. And so if we now commit this back to the repo, let me just do so. Let's take a look at those resources that were just created. We can do flux get image repositories, uh, and this will tell us we have this new repository. It scanned and found 51 tags within that repo. Uh, and now let's take a look at our policies. And our policy says, uh, OK, we found 6.5.4. That was greater than our 5.0.0 range specified. And so the latest tag, the one that we want to use, is 6.5.4. Uh, and so now that image update automation should have, in the background, found this reference and updated it in our Git repo. So let's go check the branches in our remote Git repo. Uh, we can see Flux Automated Upgrade is a new branch that Flux just created. And let's compare and pull request. I'm going to go ahead and create a pull request. And if we look at the files changed, it found our specific annotation and updated the version from 5.0 to 6.5.4. Let's say we actually want to apply that to our cluster. All we need to do is merge this pull request. And now, because we've configured everything, Flux is going to detect that change, pull in the new deployment.yaml to the base. That will get rolled out to both the base configuration and the overlay configuration because of how we set it up. And we'll get that latest version automatically applied to the cluster. I'll do a git pull here. And you see that we got the latest version. But now, a few seconds later, 
both the base pod and the overlay pod have restarted. And that's because we have the new image specified. Now, before we end, let's just jump back and review the set of things that we went through today because we covered a lot. We started talking about what GitOps is, uh, why this methodology is important, and what some of the problems that it fixed over traditional, maybe push-based uh, deployment methodologies. Uh, I showed you the demo app that we were going to be using, this pod info application that allows us to exercise a few of the, the key aspects of GitOps. We set up our Kubernetes cluster on Akamai. We installed the Flux command line as well as bootstrapped Flux into that cluster. I talked about some of the different repository structures that you might use when using a GitOps approach. And we went with this mono repo approach where we have our uh, top level clusters directory and then maybe an apps directory and an infrastructure directory. We then looked at the different ways that we can have multiple environments controlled by Flux, uh, the first of which was customize. We had that base configuration, and then we overlaid a modification via customize. We also can use Helm to install and manage uh, resources within our cluster, so taking advantage of two of the controller components within Flux. Uh, and then finally, we closed the loop by adding image update automation. So we started detecting new image tags were available and set up the configuration such that when that new tag was available, Flux was able to automatically commit back to our repo and keep things in sync with the latest and greatest. At this point, I hope that you're ready to go off and set up GitOps within your own clusters. I think it's a really powerful technique uh, that allows for a shared understanding of the state of the cluster and provides that full history of how you got to where you are today. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Kubernetes and developing with the Akamai Connected Cloud, I would urge you to check out the other videos on this YouTube channel. Uh, there's a number of videos from myself and other developer advocates teaching a variety of topics, uh, Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes related. So definitely check those out and continue to dive deeper on your development journey. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Bye.